Now, more recently, uh, as the brother before me had mentioned, colonialism was delibitating for the Muslim Ummah. The Muslim sisters, as you see in the, in the uh, handouts that I passed out, I hope that they reached also the brothers, the Muslim women leaders have not stopped contributing to the Muslim Ummah. From the time of the Prophet والسلام, up to the 19th century, Muslim women leaders all over the place, starting from uh, uh, jurors and hadith transmitters and faqihat, muhaddithat, from the time of the Prophet والسلام, descendants of Ali ibn Abi Talib an, descendants of Umm Salama, all these good companions that we hear about, they also continued the line. And mind you, when we say a woman contributes a hadith, it means that she contributes a hadith, a legislative hadith, a hadith that could have something to do with halal and haram, that has something to do with the wagib, mubah, makruh, etc. So she, when she does that, it is in the hands of a woman to give, to give legal verdicts, you see. And on this depends what we are doing now. Not one woman has contributed a belied hadith, makdhub hadith, or a fraudulent hadith. They were very authentic, which means that they were scientific in what they were doing. It wasn't just reporting, but it was accurate, honest reporting. And they were not doubted in what they were doing. Also, Muslim women leaders contributed in other areas as philanthropic contributions. So we find women giving from their money in charity, constructing mosques. One very famous woman that I remember is Zubaydah. And what she did was she noticed how the pilgrims suffered uh, in Hajj because they did not have water from Mecca to Medina. They were very thirsty. And so uh, there were no uh, uh, water pipelines, nothing. So she contributed money just to the construction of those water pipelines. And she said, hit with your axes. I want this to be finished even if each axe, if you hit with each axe, uh, the one time is worth it 10,000 dinars. So that's how contributive she was. Now, women also participated in building mosques, building hospitals. They were very charitable. There were women also at the time of the Umayyad period who, believe it or not, were uh, literateurs and poets. They, they uh, attended political debates, they attended poetic debates, and they contributed their own poetry to the Muslim causes. So we have all kinds, artistic talents, scientific talents, you have them. And we had Muslim leaders of their own nations, women that used to rule for a long time. Some of them ruled from behind the curtain. And uh, one woman, uh, Sitt al-Muluk, uh, she was, uh, I believe, in Yemen. I think that's her name. Anyway, there was that woman that ruled in Yemen behind a curtain and for several years, and she used to, she didn't want to see the men, but the men could, she could listen to them and hear uh, their arguments, and she could debate them and give them orders from behind the curtain and tell them this is what you should do and what you should not do. Now, why is it, for heaven's sakes, that we say Muslim women cannot be administrators. They cannot participate in any political process since they are deficient in mind and they cannot function, etc. There's no evidence at all. From the time of the Prophet والسلام, up to the 19th century, this trend had continued nonstop. Now then what happened after that? Why was everything uh, uh, stagnant? Now, and I also like to emphasize that this resurgence or this movement, continued movement of women, happened at worse times. Like, for example, during the Crusades, during the Mughal invasion, although the Muslim Ummah was being hit from all directions, yet women continued their contributions. And that shows how strong they were. Because if they were beaten and felt defeated, they would not want to contribute anything to society. But they continued that movement. 